Hello again, Flame community. My name is Jeff Kyle, and welcome back to part two of my tutorial on the image node here on Logic Academy. Last time, we gave you a solid fundamental idea of how the image node works and what it looks like. But in this video, we're going to dig a little deeper, jumping into what it looks like to do beauty work using the image node, what it looks like to do some color grading in the image node. And just to tie everything together, I have a few tips at the end that I just want to fit in before we finished. Once again, before we move on, thank you to Autodesk for sponsoring this video. And for now, let's get started on some typical beauty work using the image node. Here we are in my conform, and there are two shots we're going to say need some beauty work done. We don't think it's too crazy, so we're going to just try to take care of them with the image node here in the timeline instead of jumping into batch. Since this is meant to be a tutorial about the image node in general as opposed to specifically A2 Beauty, we're going to keep it simple, but I'll still walk you through exactly how I'd approach this shot. Before I jump into the effects tab, I'm going to apply a source image node to this clip. Right now, I don't know if I truly need it to be a source image node or not, but I've found more times than not, you can save yourself a lot of hassle if you decide to use that, the source image node, instead of the regular image node. If there's any chance, you'll be working with other aspect ratios. If let's say you're doing your work on a 16-9 timeline, and then you discover later that there's a 9 by 16 version, since the regular image node takes place after the resize, your demasks might have to be remade, and that's a real bummer. I've been burned enough times that my go-to move is just to use the source image node right off the bat for pretty much everything. I think the positives really do outweigh the negatives, so unless you have a crazy time warp that really makes it a hassle to work on the source, that's my recommendation. Always try to think about the big picture, even if there's a slight chance of you working with different aspect ratios or if you might need to export the shot with the work done at full res, absolutely go with the source image node. So once we've applied that source image node, let's start working. Scrubbing through the shot, let's say we need to smooth out the skin on her cheek and her chin. The cheek should be easy enough, but the chin has that pinky getting in the way, so we'll have to address that. I'll start by ensuring I'm working on Selective 1 by selecting it in the HUD. By default, the primary layer is the first thing that's selected as soon as you jump into the image node, so always make sure if you don't want to work on that primary layer, you're selecting Selective 1. As we talked about earlier, that primary layer is used as the basis for your keying, so if you do beauty work to it, you're really messing it up if we have to do any keying later. So I head up to the HUD and I select Selective 1 to make sure I'm working on that. As we mentioned, we're doing some beauty work here, but you know what? I think there's really no reason to get the A2 Beauty node out just yet, so let's just leave the Master Grade node on while we do our first track. So with Selective 1 selected, I'll just head over to the Viewer and Space G to start drawing a G mask. Let's make a few points and close it up. There are two tracking pathways ahead of us. We can either track it using the G mask or the axis. I've found more than not, it's better to track it with the axis, just because if you add more points later when you track with the G mask, I find that they really don't stick to the track. So I've just been getting in the habit of tracking with the axis. But if you find yourself not having to add points very often, then it doesn't really matter either way. But for now, I'm going to stick with the axis. So I'll click on the axis here on the left, and I'll set the tracking type to planar, and then let's start planar tracking. Auto update reference, snap, set, analyze, all in one quick motion. If you've done this operation a couple hundred thousand times, it's a pretty quick sweeping motion. So there's the track. There's a little wobble when it gets to the beginning of the shot, but I think for what we're doing, it should be fine. And I like adding my gradient softness points to my GMAX tracers by going into add points mode, which is A, with flame hotkeys. I hold down shift and I drag inward, selecting the edge of the GMAX. I think it's quicker than a few of the other methods, so that's what I like using. I think I'll add just a little bit of softness here on the right side because I'm worried about blurring that natural crease too much, but I'll add quite a bit more softness here on the left and then a few more softness points just to tidy things up. This is the kind of thing that you'll just start to understand with practice if you're new to this. And if you've drawn your fair share of GMAT tracers, then I think you understand what I'm doing here. But now that that's drawn and we're feeling good about it, let's apply A2 Beauty. I'm just going to space click on selective number one here and going to select A2 Beauty and that adds it right to the selective. If we just take a peek at the schematic, we can see now that Selective 1 has both A2 Beauty and Master Grade. If you want to stay a little bit more organized, you can just take the half a second it takes to delete that Master Grade node. But in a way, it can actually be useful. If you do some beauty work and then find it needs to be desaturated or the color adjusted in some way, it can be convenient to have that already hooked up. Those cases may be few and far between though, so you can make that decision for yourself. But anyways, as you can see, A2 Beauty has been applied to the area of the mask. So now let's just dial that in based on what we need for the shot. I'm thinking we can leave the fixed size where it is, but this is what it looks like when we adjust it. It's kind of the overall blur setting. That looks pretty good, but I think I want to reduce some of the smaller details. So I can reduce all three of these fields here in the Details tab. I'll lower the recovery amount so the larger features aren't recovered as much. I'll reduce the size that it's looking for. And finally, I'll reduce the search radius so it's only keeping the finest of fine details. 
That's looking pretty good to me. Since there's only one selective here, I can see what we've done by either toggling the front and result flame hotkeys of F1 and F4, just like you're used to doing in Batch, or I can press the H hotkey to hide and show the current selective. I'm using the I key here to hide and show the G mask to see the image a little bit better. That's looking pretty good, so now let's work on the chin. Since I think I might need a different level of A2 beauty, I'll space click on selective 2 and set it to A2 beauty. Right away, we see that the whole image is affected by A2 Beauty, and things are not looking good. But that's okay. Once we isolate the selection with the G mask, everything will be back to normal. So let's do that with a space G shortcut to start drawing our mask. But admittedly, it's kind of hard to see what we're working with since everything is still affected by A2 Beauty. The solution to this problem is to, instead of viewing the result view, once we create that G mask, we can set the viewer to object mode with F8 and now we're viewing the GMask context, or in this case, the image object mode. The benefits of this are actually twofold. Not only are you able to view the image without the selective's matchbox getting in the way, you're also able to complete the GMask tracking before any selective processing takes place. Even with a great computer, A2 Beauty is doing some pretty significant processing. So once you start getting in the realm of two, three, four, eight selectives, you're going to start to notice a very big difference, whether you're in that result view, processing all of the selectives at once, or in the image object view, where you're only processing the source image. So with that in mind, we're in object mode, and we're going to start tracking this chin area the same way we did before. Just starting to do some refinement here. I can drag this mask down over the finger now that we've tracked it, and I'm going to add a bunch of softness just so it doesn't look too hard on the edges. And now it's just refinement, bringing these points in, just slight adjustments to make that mat look good, and a little bit of keyframing since the track isn't, of course, isn't perfect, but you know, just, just good enough for what you need it for. So little adjustments here and there, key keyframes to get us the area coverage that we need. So that's looking pretty good. So let's just turn off auto key and start adjusting our A2 beauty so we can reduce that fine detail. So just going into these detail settings here and just doing some adjustments until it looks just right. And okay, good, that's feeling good. But as you can see, the finger is giving us a bit of a problem. We have to create a holdout mat for that. So it's the same concept as before. Since we're still on selective two, space G and F8 to get into image object mode, and we'll start drawing that holdout. Just a few points here and let's get tracking backwards. Not exactly the most ideal track because it's a kind of blurry finger with the hand getting in the way a bit. So I expect it's going to, yep, there it is, a little bit of drift. So we'll just adjust that drift, keep moving, make some keyframes here. Just keep tracking along, oop, backwards. So that's looking better. I think that track worked out. A little trick I have is to go into the schematic and click off of the G mask and then click back onto the G mask. And that will help us to see the keyframes for the G mask as opposed to the keyframes for the track. So I can easily go to those and adjust those key keyframes. So I just added a little bit of softness here and I'm just scrubbing to see and it's looking pretty good. So I'll just set this to subtract so that it interacts with the mask in the right way. And that's pretty much it for our holdout. But just as a last check, let's take a look at that mat. With the selective selected and not the G mask selected, when we press F8, we see the selective image object, which shows us the mat. And if we press it one more time, we get the selective image object overlay, which shows us the mat with a color on top of the original image. I prefer just the black and white mat, so I'm just gonna press it a couple more times to get back to the black and white mode. And here we are. So that's looking pretty good. I think I might just add a bit more blur to the first G mask, just to soften it a bit more. So I'll select that first G mask and I'm going to hide the G masks with the I hotkey just so I can get a better feel for the before and after here. So I'll just F1 and F4 to see the uh, result and the front just to get a good feel again. And that's looking pretty good. When I'm working, I'm constantly hiding my G masks and hiding the selectives and toggling back and forth over and over, hiding the G masks, revealing them, make a little adjustment, hide them again. It's a little dance I do just to be able to see everything that I need to see and flip back and forth quickly so I can compare it properly. One thing that I just want to call attention to is that when we subtracted that holdout mat, it did a really incredible job not creating problems with bleeding edges. This shot right in front of us is a great practical example of a real-life beauty shot, but I'd like to take a closer look at the way that selective effects works with a slightly different shot. So here we are on our second shot. It's not your traditional beauty shot, but let's say our goal here is to reduce some of the puddles and dots on the road to smooth it out without getting rid of its nice road texture and without affecting any of the road lines or signage. 
As I scrub the shot, we see it's pretty convenient that the shot doesn't require any tracking at all. There's a little bit of drift, but it's pretty much locked off. The reason I'm showing this shot here is to illustrate an interesting concept called selective effects. The Master Grade Matchbox Shader is no ordinary matchbox shader. It's actually a selective effects matchbox shader. That means that when you use it in conjunction with G-Mask tracers, Flame isn't combining a front, back, and matte like a normal composite. When you use a G-Mask tracer in the selective environment with a selective effects matchbox shader like this one, the G-Mask softness or falloff is actually the strength of the effect as opposed to just an ordinary matte. Let me show you what I mean. I'll add A2 Beauty here as the first selective, and it's going to cover up the whole screen with A2 Beauty since there's no key or G-Mask yet. Let's take a look and dial it in. I'll crank up the size, I think the detail is actually pretty good where it is. I don't need to do too much adjustment. Now, if you take a closer look at this arrow, because it's a nice large object that we can look at pretty easily, we can see that the edges of that arrow are doing exactly what we would expect. They're bleeding into the surrounding area because part of what A2 Beauty is doing is a big old blur. And when I say blur, I don't mean just a blur. It's doing a lot of incredible stuff under the hood preserving detail in ways that are pretty advanced, but it is doing a blur of some kind. In traditional compositing, not selective effects matchbox shaders, this might be a bit of a problem because when we go to restore the arrow, we'd be able to restore it, but the edge would be a big problem. Let me just draw a mask to isolate the area in question so we're not looking at the whole image here, just this section of the road. Now let's draw the holdout mat for the arrow. Just drawing this mask here, not too much to it, just drawing these points. A little bit of refinement now. And now let's set this mask to subtract instead of add. Just a little bit more refinement here, just getting that matte just right so that it subtracts properly. So with this G mask selected, I'm just going to hide all of the masks again with that I button and take a look at what's happening. I'm just going to show and hide this mask over and over again. And you can just see that when it's hidden, the edge is bleeding all over the place. But when the mask is there, there's absolutely no bleed. This is the power of selective effects. It's almost as if it's removing the arrow from A2 Beauty before the blur takes place, so the edges are looking great. We can do the same thing to the yellow and white lines on either side here, and it would do the same thing. I'm just gonna F8 view so we can see what we're working with here and draw that mask to preserve the line. I'm also gonna speed this up just a bit so that I don't have to waste your time too much. Set that to subtract. Oh, just a little bit of refinement that needs to be done on these lines before we can just A, B the result. I don't want to edit anything out just so you can see the whole process, but moments like this are a little bit less interesting, just doing a little bit of refinement of edges, but uh, nearly done here, and we'll be able to see the result. So this is what we're looking at for our result, and in order to get some extra performance, I was switching to proxy mode, so we can just swap right back to full res so you can see all of that detail now, and I'll hide the G masks, and I'll just do a little before and after here, just showing the result, the, the source, and the result, switching back and forth. You can see that the detail is wonderfully preserved, and those edges are nearly perfect. There's hardly any bleeding going on whatsoever. And I can hide the G mask here, just so you can see what it would look like if it was bleeding a little bit more. Yeah, just great stuff. That's really the power of selective effects. Just to illustrate this point visually, let me do a very quick demonstration of how this compares to a more traditional approach to the same shot. We've been working in the timeline, but let's shift over to batch. I'll just save this image node here and head over to batch. I'm gonna pull out an image node and load it. I already have the clip here, so that's there. And now I just need to grab an A2 Beauty matchbox outside of the image node and recreate the same settings we had. That's 47 size, 0.279 recovery amount, 5 size, and 15 search radius. Okay. I'm actually able to copy and paste the G masks from the image node just to make sure that they're exactly the same. So I'll pull out a G mask tracer. I'll copy those here. Paste them there. The only thing that I have to keep in mind is I'll have to just switch around a few settings to get it to work the same. I'll set these two to zero in the color, so they're pretty much subtracting. And I think we have it. I'll comp this all together. And throw a difference mat at the end so we can take a look. I think it's pretty easy to see the difference. The one we built in batch looks pretty good, but if you compare it to the one that we built in the image node, you can see that the bleeding is clearly an issue for batch. 
Again, the power of selective effects. And that concludes everything that comes to mind for beauty work. Now let's switch gears and start talking about some of the color grading workflows here in the image node. I know enough about color grading to know that there sure is a lot to know. Since I'm at least attempting to be conscious of the length of this video, we're really only going to touch on how color grading applies to the image node in terms of workflow. So even though there are tons of really important topics out there like color management or working with camera raw or camera source footage or advanced look development techniques and so on and so on, I think that's just a little out of scope for this video. Maybe we'll dig deeper in another dedicated video, but for now, let's take a look at what it looks like in general to be color grading in the image node using master grade. So let's start by looking at this first shot here. I can tell there's a pretty significant green cast over everything. So I might go into that primary layer and try to neutralize that and get everything relatively balanced so that for keying, there's that more separation and I have a better jumping off point for look development. I'll adjust the color wheel here for the gain and move it away from green, which does a pretty good job neutralizing it. And now that that's set, let's start thinking about setting some looks. Let's say one of the looks we want to create matches the overall blue cast look from another shot. Let's say this shot in particular. Instead of just eyeballing it, let's grab a reference of that blue and use it. We covered this in the last video, but control G to grab that reference. And let's call this blue ref, just to stay organized. And it'll get added to our grab references panel. So heading back to the shot in question, let's open up the compare mode and set it to angle split and point it to our grab reference, blue ref. Now we can see both at the same time and get a better feel for how we're matching it. So with selective one selected, let's add a whole lot of blue to the gain here and maybe mess with the luminance a bit just to get it to match a little bit more. I might want to go into the tone controls to get a little more control with the individual parts of the image. I can take a quick look at the compare reference overlay on my scopes and see that the reference image has its highlights just a bit brighter than mine. So why don't I bump those highlights up and maybe even the whites too. I'll just adjust the midtones a bit to get that to match as well. And maybe we'll mess with the color of these too. I think we need to give the shadows a bit more blue. But I think for the whites, I think I want to go in the opposite direction of blue, just because they need to be closer to white than blue. And now I'm feeling pretty good about this. Let's say this look is in a good place, and we want to save it. So I'll just drag the whole image node to the Timeline Effects tab. Let's call this Blue Look. Now I want to start working on that second look, so I want to reset what we've done. But if you remember, we did some initial balancing on my primary layer that I want to preserve. So instead of just dumping the whole image node to start over, let's just get rid of the selectives in question. If you delete every selective that you've used, just one in this case, then the whole selective workflow actually goes away and you get a little stuck having to manually pull out and connect your selectives again yourself. So the trick here is to add a new empty selective on two in this case, and then I'll alt click on one to get rid of it. And then I'll regular click on selective one again to add a fresh new one back in, and then delete selective two, and now we're back. Let's say this new look we're creating is going to be a little less extreme than the other one we made. Maybe we'll start out with some contrast in the tone controls to open up the image. Let's maybe add some of that blue into the midtones, but not too much. And then maybe we add some orange into the highlights just to do a hint of that teal orange Hollywood look. To keep going on this pretty cinematic looking look, let's add a vignette onto Selective 2. So I'll go to Selective 2 here. And we've mentioned how you can space G to start drawing a mask, but if you want to just pull out an already drawn ellipse, that's Alt space G. I'll draw that in the center here, but you know what? Maybe we want to make it more focused on the car, so I'll drag that up a bit and I'll add a ton of softness all the way out. Going back to Master Grade, instead of inverting the mat, we can just invert the Master Grade node itself by going to the Shader tab and selecting Outside. Now when we lower the gain, we're getting a great vignette with some nice fall off. Awesome. I'll call this Selective Vignette and we're moving on. Let's also say that we're looking to minimize just how strikingly yellow that dividing line is on the road. So I'll just hop into Selective 3 now, pick that yellow color here with a key. Okay, I've picked it, but let's see what we've got with F8. Okay, that mat's looking pretty good, but just to be safe, we'll dilate it just a bit and blur it just to reduce that noise. Now let's desaturate the yellow lines to make sure they don't stand out too much and take away from the car. And I'll call this last selective yellow reduction. And I think that's looking pretty good. This can be our second look. So let's drag it up to that selective effects tab and call it cinematic look. Now that we have our two looks, applying them onto our shots is just as easy as saving them. It's the simple act of dragging the image node back out onto the clip, and everything is replaced, allowing us to switch between these looks pretty easily. Another way to apply the look is just to double click on it. Applying the look to other shots is just as simple. We briefly mentioned it in the previous video. You can just do a multi-selection with control click or shift click, and then just drag it onto your selection. 
If in a larger color grading project you find yourself with a bunch of saved selective effects and it's getting a little bit too much, there is a pretty robust filtering system that you can take advantage of here in the Timeline Effects tab in the Explorer that can make working with a lot of saved image nodes or selectives a lot more manageable. If you have a few different looks across a bunch of different clips, you can turn on the filters, set it to segment, and then set it to current segment, and then you would only be looking at the saved timeline effects for your selected segment and not anything else. This is ideal if you have several different scenes with different looks. Filtering them allows you to make it more manageable to find them instead of having to use folders to organize them, which can be a little time consuming. So that's my first demonstration of color grading in Flame. Aside from that, let's take a look at one more color grading scenario just to round out the work that we've done. Let's say we aren't working on a full-fledged color grading job, but instead we're in a finishing environment. You're at the tail end of the project, the grade took place at another facility, and you've already done some comp and retouch work. After the latest round of client notes, the clients feel that the grade is just a little too green and could use a bit more of vignetting. They want to know if there's anything that we can do to save them the time of having to go back to the colorist because everyone knows that process takes quite a bit of time. If this feels oddly specific, then that's because this happened to me just last month. <laughs> so let's go over how you do something like that. The first order of business is to take out an image node and get to work on the ask. I'll head over to Selective 1 and reduce that green just a touch here in the Gain color wheel. And I'll just rename it Green Reduce. And then go to Selective 2, add a Circle G mask with Alt Space G, and add that softness. I'll go to the Shader tab and set the Selective to Outside, and then lower the Gain just a bit. And let's end up by calling this one Vignette. With these two selectives, that's pretty much it. Now it's the simple act of applying that to every shot. Here in the Effects tab, as we've covered already, that's pretty easy. We'll select all the shots, and I'll drag the image node up there and apply it to everything. And then I'll just do a quick run through most of these shots, just to make sure everything's looking good and that it was applied correctly. Since there's no specific G masks, just the one general one that works for any shot, and no keys, these selectives should work really well for just about every shot. But otherwise, we've successfully addressed the client notes in a relatively short time and applied it to all of the shots in the cut. This concludes everything that I wanted to talk about for the specific color grading workflows, but I do have a wonderful segue into one of the extra tips that I have, and that has to do with the adjustment we just made and something called the connected conform. If you take a look at my desktop, you see that we have three cuts in question, a 30, a 15, and a 6. For this to work the most effectively, you might consider setting everything up with the connected conform workflow. Conveniently, my last Logic Academy video was a three-parter that goes into wonderful detail about how to set up the connected conform. So if you're interested in learning about that, we'll have a link in the description of this video. But once you're up and running and everything is set up nicely, I recommend doing your image node work in your sources sequence, just to be sure you don't miss a shot that's in one spot but not another. But as long as you're conscious of that, there's nothing wrong with working on, say, the 30 first, just to make sure you account for the shot-to-shot -shot context as opposed to working in the sources sequence, which typically orders the shots in camera order. In this particular case of my example with the green reduction and the vignette, I started the work on the sources sequence. Now it's time to view it in context. I'll just select all of the shots and sync the image node to my connected segments. The big thing to keep in mind is that if you're jumping around a lot, you always have to sync the image node to send it from sequence to sequence. Now that they're synced, here I am in the 30, and let's say one of these shots needs a little adjustment. Maybe I'm finding that the green reduction adjustment is a little bit too noticeable and drastic, going from this shot to this shot. So I'll adjust that here in the 30. But when I'm done, I have to remember to sync that change back to the other cuts, otherwise it'll only exist here in the 30. This definitely takes some getting used to, but as long as you know to think about it, I think it makes a lot of sense and I think the workflow works just fine. The next little tip I have to talk about has to do with the image node in batch. When you're working in the timeline, in terms of the scope of the work that you can typically complete in the timeline, the image node gives you pretty much everything you need to get the job done there. And as we saw, it's a super quick scalable setup. In batch, of course, the image node works virtually the same way, and it's just as scalable, allowing you to add new selectives with the click of a button. But there might be times that you need to use the mats that you're creating with the image node. In a batch environment, it makes sense to use your mats for multiple purposes across the node graph. But when you use an image node in batch, you are locking yourself in to essentially a flattened composite. You can't get mats out of an image node. It's just not built that way. You can choose to live with this fact and come to terms with it as a compromise, but it's important to know that there is another way. I mentioned in the first video that the image node is based on action. You can take advantage of that by just taking your image node and copy and pasting it right into an action node. Select everything in the image node and copy it. Then drag out a fresh new action node and paste it in. The only gotcha here is that the priority of your G-masks and selectives can get a little confused in the copy and paste transition, so you'll have to give that a once over and reorder them. 
Another option is just to start working out of action from the get-go, if you're using batch and the selective workflow and you think there's any chance you'll need mat outputs. It takes an extra step or two, but we're talking about seconds here, so I think it's a fair price to pay. But once you're here, to get the mats out, you'll use something called selective mat extraction. The way it works is you first add this selective mat extraction matchbox to a selective. Then, in the action output tab, you add a new output, set it to all objects, and then just make sure the edit output mode, which is alt E in flame hotkeys, sets everything up correctly. Let's say the first output should be the comp, so I'll make sure that the selective mat extraction matchbox has its output edited off for the first output. And I think the second output should be the mat, so I'll make sure that the selective mat extraction matchbox has its output edited on for this output. And that gives you the output of the comp on one, and the mat for the other. One thing to note is that it is one selective per selective mat extraction matchbox. So if you have a particularly busy selective setup, it would take a little bit to set up. And I have to mention that if you find yourself going back and adding more selectives after you've created the selective mat extraction setup, you will have to spend some time making sure your outputs are set correctly. For this reason, the selective mat extraction process is great to do at the end, as opposed to setting it up early, because if you're still doing a bunch of iterating, it turns into a lot of back and forth adjusting those outputs. But that's what I have to say about the image node in batch and the selective workflow in batch. And the last little tip I have for us to end our tutorial is how to handle exporting clips at their native resolution, but with the image node still applied. This is one that I've seen asked from time to time, so I figured it's good to get ahead of this one since it does come up occasionally. There are a few ways to export clips in Flame. You can drag a clip out of the timeline and export that, but if you look closely at it, you'll see that it has all of the timeline effects still applied, meaning that it inherits the resolution of the sequence. My tip here has to do with exporting the native resolution, so this won't work. You could do a sequence publish, which allows you to export a whole timeline and it will export all the clips individually, but your two options here are either to bake in the timeline effects, which remember that includes the resize timeline effects, getting us back to square one and inheriting the resolution of the sequence, or to export it with no timeline effects, which would definitely get our native resolution back, but it doesn't include the image node. So let's talk about how to do this. The solution involves using the match feature in Flame. You'll head to the shot in question and match it out onto the desktop. And be sure to take a quick look at the match settings. If you want to keep the handles the same, you just make sure that preserve handles is checked. Otherwise, if it's unchecked, then the handles will be expanded. And definitely make sure you're not including timeline effects. Then with it matched to the desktop, head back to the sequence in question, on the clip in question, find the image node, and you have a few options here. If you're using the connected conform workflow, then you'll get the option to sync image to connected segments. But the beauty of this is you don't need to be using the connected conform. Since it's a shared source segment, you can just sync the shared source segment to, in this case, all reels, because it's not in the sequence reel. This will send the image node to the clip you've matched onto the desktop, but not the resize node, giving us exactly what we wanted, the native resolution with the image node. Just head up to that clip and take a look at it just to make sure it did what you wanted, and then you're good to export at its native resolution with the effects applied. One big thing to note, as we've talked about before, you can potentially run into some serious problems if you aren't working with the source image node mostly having to do with G-masks not lining up if there's any repo or scale adjustment whatsoever on that resize or action node. Otherwise, this method works for single clips as well as whole sequences. For a full sequence, let's say your sources sequence for instance, you can select all of the clips in it, match them all out to the desktop, and then head back to the sources sequence, and with every clip still selected, select one of the image nodes, and since you have the rest of the clip selected, it'll send all of the image nodes to their match source on the desktop once you sync image to shared source segments. And that's my tutorial on the image node. I really do hope you learned a thing or two along the way. If you have any questions about anything I covered, or you want to chat about this topic in any way, the best way to reach me is actually on the Logic forums over at forum.logic.tv. We'll have a thread dedicated to this video, so you can either respond there, make a new thread asking questions, or just send me a direct message. I'm more than happy to help in any way that I can. Thanks again for tuning in to Logic Academy. My name is Jeff Kyle, and I'll see you next time.